Hello Saints and future Saints. Thank you for studying with me again today on this video. In my last video we went over, um, we investigated the question of who is coming back with Jesus Christ at the second coming and we went through a lot of information on that. In that video I also mentioned that there were other uh, teachings, other myths that were being passed on as the truth, as being true but are actually part of uh, church tradition. So I mentioned something in that last video. One of those myths was the phrase being born again. And I asked the question, are you born again or are you saved into the body of Christ? And I wonder, do you already know the answer? So. In line with the topic of my last video, like I said, I listed 10 uh, different myths being taught in Christendom today. And one of those myths that I mentioned is, again, preachers teaching that once you get saved, you're born again. Now, have you told anyone somewhere down the line in your lifetime that you are a born again Christian? I know I have, and chances are most of us have. And the context comes from the verse uh, that Jesus speaks to Nicodemus when he says, Ye must be born again. So today, if you ask a Christian if he or she is born again, there's a 99% chance uh, that the answer you're going to get is a resounding yes. Today, we investigate using God's Word, rightly dividing, if it's even possible for us, the body of Christ, to be born again in the same context, the context that Jesus uses with Nicodemus in the book of John, chapter 3. So let's take a look at it real quick. John 3, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, Ye must be born again. Now, when we study the Bible rightly divided, the term born again is something that only pertains to the nation of Israel. And in this study, like I said, we're going to uncover the fact that no Gentile today can be born again. In order to understand why only Israel can be born again, we have to understand how they were born the first time, right? So in Exodus, the nation of Israel was born the first time when God delivered them out of Egypt. The Lord calls the nation his firstborn son. This is the context of what is born of the flesh is flesh. In Exodus 4, 22-23, And thou shalt say unto Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord Israel, Is my son even my firstborn? And I say unto thee, let my son go, that he may serve me, and if thou refuse, it, refuse to let him go, behold, I will slay thy son, even thy firstborn. Now, as soon as Israel was delivered and redeemed out of Egypt, they were sanctified as a people. When they were given the law by Moses, the, uh, the Mosaic Covenant. So, why does Israel need to be born again? you ask well let's find out if you've read the Old Testament you know that Israel has had a very rocky relationship with our Lord God you know they started out good then they go bad 
then they go good again, then they end up worshiping idols, and they go bad again. You see, over time, as Israel becomes disobedient, and, uh, you know, over that time, they became uh, idol worshipers, and, and where the law was, sin abounded. So, surely God freed them from Egypt, and they were no longer bound as slaves, but they were bound by the covenant to their sins and they had no way out as Israel's sins grew it was clear that merely being born a Jew into the promises and the covenants of God wasn't causing them to serve the Lord they were they had bondage around their necks they were they were yoked under the law and, and to sin so the prophet spoke to Israel of the new covenant that one uh, that they would replace the old covenant in Jeremiah. Jeremiah 31, 31. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Now, look at what this covenant would do for them. In Ezekiel 36, 27. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and ye shall keep my judgments and do them. Now, it was this covenant that was necessary for God to fulfill his kingdom promises to Israel. And here lies the message Jesus gives to Nicodemus about being born again. You see, Nicodemus already knew all about this new covenant that the prophet spoke about. And this is why Jesus says here in John 3.10, Jesus answered and said unto him, Art thou a master of Israel, and knowest not these things? Jesus is making a rhetorical statement here to Nicodemus, okay? He's putting him on the spot. And Nicodemus should have known that Israel had a great need and that the need was for their nation to be redeemed from the old covenant. That bondage, they need to be redeemed in order to enter the kingdom that God promised them. In John 3, 3, again, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Jesus made it clear to Nicodemus that the nation had to be born again when he said, Ye must be born again. In John 3, 7, Marvel not that I said unto thee, Ye must be born again. In Isaiah 66, 7, before she travailed, she brought forth, before her pain came, she was delivered of a man-child. Who hath heard such a thing? Who hath seen such things? Shall the earth be made to bring forth in one day? Or shall a nation be born at once? For as soon as Zion travailed, she brought forth her children. Shall I bring to the birth and not cause to bring forth? Saith the Lord, shall I cause to bring forth and shut, up, shut the womb, saith thy God? This is also in direct correlation with Revelation 12.5. In Revelation 12, And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. And she being with child cried, travailing in pain, in pain to be delivered, and there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and seven crowns upon his heads. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven, and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. And she brought forth a man-child, who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up unto God, and to his throne. Now, you see here, Jesus came to Israel ministering their need for being born again through a better covenant. No longer would Israel be identified by the old covenant, but by this new one. Only Israel could be born again, because only Israel was born unto God a first time. In Exodus 4.22, And thou shalt say unto Pharaoh, This saith the Lord, Israel is my son, even my firstborn. Now Gentiles were strangers of the covenants and without God, uh, completely without God, we see that in Ephesians 2.12, that at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens 
from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of, the, of promise having no hope and without God in the world. Gentiles were not born into God's covenants. Our salvation is not a second time opportunity. It's the first time salvation that we have. It's offered directly to us without Israel's covenant. Our salvation by grace is not a result of us changing our lives or, or being super spiritual or in some way, you know, uh, obeying God's statutes. Our salvation isn't described as being born again into a, a second covenant, but it's being made alive into a new creature. And Paul writes about this in Ephesians 2, 15, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace. So Paul describes this new creature. He called it the body of Christ. It was a mystery kept secret all the way up to Paul's conversion. One important thing about this new body is that it's not bound by the Mosaic laws. In Romans six fourteen, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. In Galatians three twenty eight, There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. The new creature is, is the subject of the mystery of Christ and it couldn't have been known by Nicodemus uh, or the prophets nor any of the apostles in John 3 you see herein lies the problem when people use born again to describe their salvation it hides the preaching and the meaning of the cross which is unique to the formation of our new creature the new body in Christ Jesus born again language takes us back to before the cross in John 3 and replaces our gospel of Christ with Israel's uh, kingdom gospel, the new covenant. Okay, Born again language is a denial of the mystery of Christ revealed to the Apostle Paul and then revealed to us. Being born again is something for the nation of Israel. You, you couldn't be born again even if you wanted to. What you can be is saved by God's grace through faith in his finished work on the cross. At the moment you believe, you trust in faith, as outlined in Paul's gospel according to 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4, the Holy Spirit seals you in Christ, making you part of a new creature. Trusting the cross of Christ is what saves you today. Trusting your experience, your devotion, or your changed life will not save you friends being saved is far better than being born again so now that we've got some basic uh, descriptions of what being born again means we need to dig a little bit deeper into God's Word rightly dividing according to the understanding of the dispensations okay in John 3 3 again Jesus answered and said unto him verily verily I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, look closely at verse 7, John 3, 7. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. Notice the words, thee and ye. Okay, they're there for a very, very important reason. The new translations out there want to convince you that the King James Version Bible uses words that are out of date, okay? And the people who rewrite God's words and create new versions, they'll tell you that we don't need the old English words anymore to understand the Bible. They'll say things like, you know, they're hard words to understand. The King James Version is too hard uh, to study. These antique words are useless today. And, you know, that's what they want to say, okay? And, and they say... Uh, you know what you need is a new easy to understand version but those words the English words are that are in the King James Bible are there for a reason you see the King James Bible was first published in 1611 nearly 200 years before 1611 people had already quit saying the and ye 
okay the old English the English speaking people of the world were already saying uh, using you instead of the and ye so you you can mean uh, you can mean you individually or it can mean all of you which is plural but when it comes to the words the and ye they're very specific those words mean certain things okay the Hebrew and the Greek languages uh, in which the Bible was written have very specific words to mean you individually or all of you meaning plural and, and the King James translators in their uh, in their letters which is sometimes printed in front of the King James Bible it says that it was their desire to make one more exact translation of the scriptures all right and that's what they did so they retained the distinctive meanings of the words you individually or all of you in plural but you know, okay and, and the Hebrew and Greek words are translated into the English language for you to understand the and ye in other words in verse 7 the Lord says unto thee unto you Nicodemus I am talking specifically and directly to you all right that's what the means the when he says says unto thee that means I am speaking to you specifically okay and then he says ye in other words a group of people the whole group all of you which in in the context of in in this reference is to the whole house of Israel the lost sheep of the house of Israel ye must be born again so in your King James Bible the T words <clears throat> the thee and thou are singular okay it's an easy way to remember this and the Y words are plural so to recap it as simply as possible to be reborn or born again is a reference to the nation of Israel they're the first born in the flesh coming out of Egypt then their rebirth will come during Daniel 70th week they'll be reborn as a nation in Christ Jesus in Genesis 46 3 and he said I am God the God of thy fathers fear not to go down into Egypt for I will there make of thee a great nation okay God made them a great nation in Egypt when they were coming out so here Israel is born in the flesh they become a nation in the flesh so when are they born again in the spirit I just mentioned it all right when when they as a nation repent and believe and trust in faith that Jesus Christ is their Messiah this will happen through Daniel 70th week and at the second coming this has nothing to do with us today Saints we're not born again we're sanctified the moment we receive the Holy Spirit by belief and faith again in 1st Corinthians 15 1 through 4 uh, not repentance being baptized and believing Jesus as our Messiah okay can you see the difference you, you can see here in this situation why it's important to use the King James Version Bible because the, the KJV points out clearly that the word ye is a reference to the nation of Israel when Jesus says ye must be born again he was he didn't say Nicodemus you need to be born again he said ye the nation of Israel must be born again they were born the first time in the flesh and now they need to be reborn spiritually which could have happened if they wouldn't have rejected him uh, you know before stoning Stephen and all that and but it will surely happen during Daniel's 70th week okay but in the newer versions they use the word you must be born again and it causes confusion the newer versions make it sound like Nicodemus is is being talked to concerning him but that's not the case the King James Version gives us the correct context of what Jesus was talking about when he said to Nicodemus, Ye must be born again. The nation of Israel as a whole must be born again in the Spirit before Jesus brings the kingdom of heaven to the earth and establishes them, uh, for them the earthly kingdom. We read that God promised Peter and the rest that they would rule over the twelve tribes on earth. That is their earthly kingdom. This is another reason why it's so important to understand the difference between the earthly kingdom and the kingdom of heaven. The first one being for the believing Jews, the nation of Israel, who make it through Daniel's 70th week, and the other 
the heavenlies is our promise, the promise that the body of Christ will rule from heaven in Christ over his government. This is part of the mystery program that was revealed to Paul and then revealed to us through his letters. So, be, But because they blew their last chance with Stephen, their next chance as a nation uh, to be born again will take place during the 70th week of Daniel and not before. You see, if the nation of Israel would have turned to Jesus Christ at their last chance when Stephen was offering the kingdom once again, if they would have repented then and there, they would have been born again as in the context that Jesus used speaking to Nicodemus. Ye must be born again. But they refused their rebirth and they stoned Stephen uh, to death, putting, him, putting off their spiritual rebirth until after the tribulation period, Daniel's 70th week. So today, the body of Christ is baptized by the Holy Spirit and we're saved instantly. We're regenerated, we're sanctified, we're sealed forever. Now again, as for us, the church, the saints, we become a member of the body of Christ Jesus the moment we're saved. So we're born into the body of Christ immediately. Paul tells us that we're made new creatures. A new creature is a new creature, right? You see, folks, we've been taught by tradition for so long that we automatically assume things as being correct just because we keep hearing it over and over again. You know, the saying goes, if you tell somebody a lie enough times, if you tell people a lie over and over and over again, eventually that lie will be believed as the truth. And here's one of those cases, okay? Here we see one of those examples, being born again. But unfortunately, there's more than one tradition out there. There's many false teachings within the body of Christ that we assume are factual just because we're told the same lie over and over again. In my last video, I listed over 10 such lies and myths that most Christians believe as being true. Some of them were uh, the church is the bride waiting for her groom at the rapture. The church, uh, the bride will be coming back with Jesus Christ at, on white horses at the second coming. Uh, that Peter and Paul both taught the same gospels. That Matthew 24 is a picture of the rapture. Uh, specifically, the part where it says two in the field, one taken, one left. Uh, you know, they believe that the one taken is a picture of the rapture, and it's just not true. You believe, uh, they believe that the first there, there must be a falling away within the church before the seven-year tribulation period can begin. They believe baptism is necessary to seal their salvation. They believe that the four Gospels are part of the New Testament just because there's a piece of paper before the book of Matthew that says New Testament on it. Uh, and they believe that the church has become Israel. And both are the same thing. And the list goes on and on. Several other things taught as tradition within the church body that have nothing to do with right, rightly dividing and dispensations. Things that are not in God's Word, but they're being taught as being in God's Word. Now sure, they might be in God's Word if you don't rightly divide, but in order to put these myths into the Word of God, you have to add words, you have to remove words, you have to take things out of context, you have to twist context, and so on. But if you rightly divide, and if you have a solid foundation on what dispensations are, you'll discover these myths aren't found in God's Word. They've been added there by the enemy over time, and a lot of times they're added when they take it, uh, they, they change the King James Bible and create new versions. In the newer versions or perversions, they change little things, tiny phrases, tiny words like the word ye, and change it to the word you. And by doing that, they completely change the context and the meaning of the verse. They hide the truth and they create a new truth by adding lies. I can't stress enough, please use the King James Version Bible only in, in if you want to know the truth, then use the KJV. If, if you use the newer versions, you'll be fed lies and you're going to get confused. Now, did you know that the newer versions completely remove entire verses from the King James Version Bible? Entire passages are removed. And you can bet that those passages that they remove are essential to understanding the context of what's being said. God put them there for a very good reason, friends. I have a video on all the changes 
uh, most of the changes anyway, between the King James Version and the NIV. Please take a look at it. It's on my channel. Uh, the name of it is called Caught Red-Handed. And I show you verse by verse how they've changed God's Word to fit their agenda. Also, within that video, I point you to another video that's uh, that I didn't make. Somebody else made it that reveals the New World Agenda uh, and their plan to include changes in the Bible to help them accomplish their evil goals. The name of that video that reveals their evil agenda is called the New Order of Barbarians and if you start at minute mark 42 to 45:10, he explains why they're changing things in the Bible. Now, with that said, I hope this has opened your eyes to some truth. I know it's a lot to take in. Uh, it was for me, but rightly dividing and understanding dispensations is the key, my friends, to giving you comfort and peace in Christ Jesus. Because most of you have been taught tradition over and over again for so long, you know, we just accept it as all being facts, and it hurts when we find out that we've been lied to, especially by preachers and teachers that we've trusted over the years. It hurts so much sometimes that we refuse to believe the truth and just stick to the lies or traditions that we've been taught. That happens too. Believe me, when I say it's not easy making videos like this, especially when I too was caught up in believing things that just aren't in God's Word, and I took them all as being facts, it's not easy exposing these things, but I have no choice. These things have to be revealed, and I pray that you really think about this study truthfully and learn how to rightly divide, learn how to uh, expose it to the system of dispensations, understanding dispensation, and perhaps in the future I'll make more videos on other myths and traditions uh, that I've mentioned earlier. But for now, peace and grace, love in Christ Jesus be with all of you, and I look forward to studying with you again on the next video, Lord Jesus willing.